This video is just gonna be packed with writing advice and I'm also going to share stuff I've gotten from books on writing craft and from other author tubers that I picked up, just everything that I've really picked up in the last few years of writing seriously. So I'm very excited to dive in and I mostly wanna organize the advice into kind of the same categories as our last video we just did, part one in this series, the writing process. So we'll talk about advice for coming up with a story idea, advice for outlining like planning it out and advice for drafting it and for editing it and for publishing. And then we'll have kind of an other category, but I actually kind of want to start with Pinterest. So I've got my computer here and I actually am going to do a screen recording so we can just do this together. And I am going to show you my Pinterest, which the reason I'm starting with this is because that's where I started when I was a brand new writer looking for motivation and inspiration. And I, you know, after I began reading some books and I began watching author too, but this is kind of where I started. And so some of my favorite writing advice is actually here on Pinterest. So I have a board, I'm just going to zoom through this called when I write, that's just what I named it like three years ago when I started. I was like, when I write, this is what I want to remember. And there's a lot of things I save on here. I save random character names and I save how to do more specific things, but I also save my favorite quotes. So a lot of quotes on Pinterest are about the first draft, such as this one. Every first draft is perfect because all a first draft has to do is exist. I'm gonna actually scroll through these because there's so much about the first draft. Don't be afraid to write crap because crap makes great fertilizer. <laughs> I love that. Um, there's actually a really good quote here by Anne Lamott. Very few writers really know what they are doing until they've done it. But in chair, hands on keyboard. This is an acronym B-I-C-H-O-K that you'll see a lot. It's just butt in chair, hands on keyboard. Like the way that you get it done is to just do it. And we're going to talk more about that because honestly, the best way to learn is just by doing. So many of us have learned this the hard way that the best way to learn how to write is to actually sit down and do it, to have the butt in chair, hands on keyboard mentality and just go for it. And a lot of people said this in the Instagram polls, but I think Ingrid said it my favorite. She said, how true learning by doing is for writing. No matter how much you read, and I will add to that, no matter how much you research, no matter how much you create Pinterest boards, no matter how much you talk to writing friends and talk about being a writer, no matter how much you do all this other stuff, you just have to write to learn how to write. Like you just have to do it. <laughs> this is another great quote to emphasize that point. Start writing no matter what. The water doesn't flow until the faucet is turned on. Or this one, which is a little bit more encouraging than the first drafts are crap kind of stuff, which is first drafts don't have to be perfect. They just have to be written. And one of the biggest uh, roadblocks, I guess you could say, to writing, to just sitting down and writing is often we don't feel like it. So just know that if you don't feel like writing, you're actually not alone, you're totally normal. This is one of my favorite quotes that helped me with that feeling, which is the desire to write actually grows with writing. Part of writing is actually a discipline and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I'm transitioning away from Pinterest already into my feelings, but I just really want you guys to know that it's totally normal to not always feel like writing. And if you wait for the muse to come, you will probably write like once or twice a year, honestly, because it's just not something you usually feel like doing before you're doing it. And sometimes not even during the writing process. In fact, my favorite feeling is actually right when I've just finished writing. That's probably how I feel the best because I've accomplished it and I can see how far I've come. But prior to that, it's hard. And speaking of discipline, this is another one of my favorite quotes here. Being a good writer is 3% hard work and 97% not getting distracted by the internet. <laughs> I wish that wasn't true, but that is pretty accurate. This is another quote that addresses first drafts. You might not write well every day, but you can always edit a bad page. You can't edit a blank page. And so this is again, just more motivation for how we need to get words on the page before we can make them good words. Like we have to have something to work with, some clay to form. And that relates to this quote, which I've seen tons of different times. I have it saved on my Pinterest board and like another picture, but it says, I'm writing a first draft and reminding myself that I'm simply shoveling sand into the box so that later I can build castles. All right, last one for Pinterest before we move on. This one, I just felt like we should touch on because it'll make everybody feel better. Every writer I know has trouble writing. I feel like the theme of this video is you're not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> it's going to be okay because 
we have all been in your shoes and what you're feeling right now when you go through the lows, when you go through the highs, we've been there. It's normal. Okay, I lied. One more. Um, this is Anne Lamott again. She is amazing. The author of Bird by Bird. She says, almost all good writing begins with terrible first efforts. You need to start somewhere. <laughs> so um, that reminds me of this thing called the taste gap. This is a long one, but it's worth hearing. So just bear with me and really let this sink in. Nobody tells this to people who are beginners. I wish someone had told me. All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste, but there is this gap. For the first couple of years you make stuff, it's just not that good. It's trying to be good, it has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game is still killer, and your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase they quit. Most people I know who do interesting creative work went through years of this. We know our work doesn't have the special thing that we want it to have. We all go through this. And if you are starting out or you are still in this phase, you got to know it's normal. And the most important thing you can do is do a lot of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week you will finish one story. It is only by going through a volume of work that you will close that gap and your work will be as good as your ambitions. And I took longer to figure out how to do this than anyone I have ever met. It's gonna take a while. It's normal to take a while. You just gotta fight your way through. Go out and find quotes like these that speak to you personally, things that address your fears and your doubts and your insecurities about writing. And what I did personally is I would write those quotes and put them on my wall, whether on a sticky or something nicer, it really doesn't matter. And I would again, obviously save them on Pinterest. If you want to go make a Pinterest board, uh, definitely do things like that, that will remind you because sometimes we are just really forgetful and we'll be like, yeah, I know that the first draft is crap, but then you sit down and you try to write something that's like absolute perfection because you forgot. You forgot that the first draft is just you getting the words on the page. You forgot that you're just trying to get something out that you can edit later. So give yourself the reminders. You would be surprised how much it helps to have those little reminders front and center. So if you need to have something that's like butt in chair, hands on keyboards, like along the top of your computer, just to remind you, like just sit down and do the work. That's awesome. Like whatever works for you. What works for me is I've shown you guys this many times before. I made this cute little like tiny picture frame and I keep this on my desk. This has really just helped me because it's such a great reminder to me that Nobody really knows what their novel is going to look like in the end. Nobody knows the full finished perfect story. They just know the next step, what you can see in your headlights right ahead of you. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to kind of go through advice for the different parts of the writing process and definitely don't tune out if you're not in that particular stage because you might find that something still applies to you even if you're in another stage. But first is coming up with story ideas and brainstorming. My first tip in this section is to ask questions and specifically to ask the question, what if? Let's use the Stolen Kingdom as an example for this one because I asked the question, what if, a lot when I was world building. And so I asked, you know, what if the genie or, you know, the genie were like a race of people? They were their own separate group or people group, I guess not people, but you get the idea. And you know, well, then they would have to probably have their own land of some sort, like their own homeland. And what would they look like? And what would their goals be? And how would they interact with people? And, uh, you know, like all these questions came into being and would they still have abilities like genies and other stories? Would they have different abilities? What if some of them had some abilities and some had other abilities and you follow that rabbit trail and just keep going with it. But then my second piece of advice that is really related to that. And I learned this from an author tuber who's no longer on YouTube. So I can't remember her name, but she said that you need to not just go with the first idea. Don't even go with the second or third idea most of the time because those are going to be the most cliche, the most expected. She said keep brainstorming until you have four, five, or more ideas because at that point you will typically have a lot more to choose from and you can kind of compare which is the most exciting and interesting to you and often that fourth and fifth idea that has kind of stretched you and stretched your brainstorming will be a lot more exciting and intriguing. My third piece of advice is one that you hear everywhere and I don't know where it originated but it is simply that story ideas 
are a dime a dozen. And what that means essentially is that there's so many writers who are freaked out that their idea is going to get stolen, but nobody can write a story the way that you can. It's not really an idea that makes a good book. It's the execution of the idea and how you write it. Don't stress about if somebody else has the same idea. Honestly, it's just an idea and it's how you write the story and how you share that idea, your storytelling that makes the book a good book. I can't tell you how many people have written to me where they're like, I had this idea, but then I saw this author already did it. And so now I can't do it. Right. And I'm like, no, it's just an idea. Don't stop writing your idea just because there's something similar out there. Just keep it in mind and make yours totally different because it's all about how you write it and nobody can write it quite like you. And so just for an example, I wrote Evelyn's number and then I found after publishing, like six months after publishing, that there is a very similar story out there with people having numbers, uh, but it's not tattooed on their neck and the world is totally different and it's more of a like a love story and it's, it's just nothing like mine. Like I read the first few pages and I was like, okay, the synopsis makes them sound similar, but they're worlds apart. They're nothing alike whatsoever. And so I just, I was like, oh, okay, it's fine. The only reason you should be worried is if you are actually directly intentionally copying somebody. That's the only time I would be worried. <laughs> Charity Bailey, I hope I'm saying her name right, said, without conflict, there isn't a story. And I think that's fantastic advice. Emma Woodham said, write what you know. And I love this because I mean, it's not a requirement, by the way, especially if you're writing science fiction and fantasy, because you're probably not going to know technically a lot of the stuff you're making it up, like totally creating new worlds. But this idea of pulling ideas from what you already know definitely makes the writing process and coming up with ideas a lot easier. So definitely give yourself permission to pull from your own history and your own wealth of knowledge. Let's talk about advice for plotting slash pantsing next, kind of the planning stage in general. Quirky Works, I hope I'm saying that right, says research multiple plotting styles to find a good fit. Don't just use the first one that you see slash find. And I kind of talked about this in part one in this series when we were talking about the writing process. And I talked about like, don't lock yourself in to any one strategy or, you know, plotting plan. Uh, give yourself that freedom to try new things because sometimes the best way to unlock your creativity is actually to try something new. Sarah Creviston Lee says, don't underestimate planning at the beginning, even as a pantser. And JC Scraba, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, says kind of the same thing. I wish I knew how important it was to have an idea of the ending, even vaguely. Vaguely? however you say that word. Uh, so you guys get the idea. I don't need to repeat this because a lot of people said this, but I personally am a firm believer in planning just enough to get excited and feel ready to write the story. So I have a lot of people who have asked me how much detail is too much. And it's not so much about like, do you have too much or not enough? Because there's a lot that you might come up with that won't ever get actually included in the story and it's good for you to know but at some point you really do just have to move forward because it's very 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 easy to get stuck in one stage so my biggest advice honestly is just get enough like that's going to look different for everybody because some people are going to need to brainstorm more and other people are going to feel comfortable pantsing so just get enough for you to feel like i'm excited about this scene and i think i can write it that's the amount of detail that you need because otherwise it can be very easy, like I said, to get stuck in the brainstorming or stuck in that first draft, that first chapter, if you don't continue to try to push forward. So my next bit of advice is to give yourself deadlines and time limits to kind of keep yourself moving forward. Go, okay, I have, you know, two weeks to brainstorm. And after that, I'm going to start writing. Then it kind of, not only does it put you on a sort of deadline, which will make you kind of push harder, honestly, but then it also forces you to step into the next stage at a certain point. Obviously these deadlines are movable. Like if you don't feel ready, you can push it back. I'm not saying, you know, get really, really, really strict, but I would say, for example, if you are writing your first draft and you've been writing over a year and you want to speed up and kind of keep yourself moving so that you can get into the next stage, which is editing, then what you could do is set yourself a deadline of, you know, I'm going to finish this draft in a month. And, you know, then you can figure out and break it down and make a plan for how to do that. And I have a video 
right here about how to make a plan. Honestly, that plus writing friends are probably the two biggest things you need to finish your book, to have the accountability and the goal that you're aiming towards those deadlines. When it comes to first draft advice, we really spent a lot of time on that in the beginning with those Pinterest quotes that I showed you, but I think we should talk about it a little bit more. I have a video on first draft hacks right here, which I will link below. And I have a playlist that's focused on NaNoWriMo, which we'll talk about more, but essentially NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month is about writing your first draft. So all of the tips in this playlist are really zeroed in on the first draft and writing the first draft. So you can click on playlists on my channel and you can click on this NaNoWriMo series to find tons of tips on things like having a plan, don't compare, write what you're excited about, uh, form writing habits and rituals, which will help you get in the zone faster, how to manage your time, how to overcome writer's block, how to overcome doubt and imposter syndrome. I talk about something called rewards, which is essentially giving yourself something to look forward to and be excited about that you get once you complete a certain goal. I talk about uh, growing your word count and writing great chapters and how to do world building. I try not to repeat myself on this channel too much, so go and watch those videos if any of them calls to you. I will link them all below, which leads to the next bit of advice, and that is finish your book. I cannot tell you how many writers, including myself, have spent time just writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting the first couple chapters. Honestly, it's very foolish and I've done it, so I'm not like criticizing you guys because I've been there. But the reason that this is an issue is because you cannot actually learn how to write a fully formed story and learn about character arcs and story arcs and how to write middles and endings and how to write a character that grows. You can't learn all these essential things if you're only writing the first couple chapters. And honestly, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I don't even get to know my characters fully until I've seen their entire story. I don't feel like I know them just from the beginning. I'm like, it's like a very surface level relationship at that point. And so the best thing you can do for yourself is honestly to let the beginning be mediocre. Let it be good enough for now because you can edit it later. That said, I do want to mention that if you do feel the need to edit before you go back into writing, that's okay too. Like there's no hard and fast rule and a lot of writers do like to edit uh, as they write, but I would encourage you if you want to do this to set time limits and you know deadlines for yourself in that area so that you just don't get stuck there again. As long as you have um, a set time limit or a set amount before you move on, you should be okay. Like for example, I know some writers who will edit for an hour before they write for an hour or others who will go back and look at just the previous day's work, fix that up a little bit and then move on. You get the idea. There is no wrong way to do this. You can move forward without looking back or you can look back occasionally, but the idea is to just not get stuck in one place. That is the goal. When it comes to advice on the first draft, I also think we need to talk about writing sprints. So if you've never heard of a writing sprint or a word sprint, they're called lots of different things. The reason these are so effective is because they push you to write as many words as possible in a very short amount of time. So it's in the name. Again, it's a word sprint, writing sprint. And the idea is to, it frees you up to not like question every single word and slow down because you have to get as many words as you can in a short amount of time. So it just makes you write faster and not delete and agonize and stress and perfectionize. That's not a word, but it is now. And you get the idea. Different people actually prefer different lengths of writing sprints. So for example, I prefer a little bit shorter because I start to zone out really fast. So if I can do like a 15 minute writing sprint, 10 minutes is a little bit too short for me to get in the zone. 20 minutes is when I have already started fading out, but other people prefer 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Other people might prefer five minutes. And when I am in a really big writing slump and I just don't feel like doing it, sometimes I will do five minute sprints because just telling myself, I just have to write for five minutes. That's not that hard. I can do that. It can really, really help you. So it's motivating. It pushes you to not be a perfectionist. And it also is a thing you can do with writing friends. And we'll talk more about that in, in the next video in the series, part three, when we talk about writing friends. One last bit of writing advice for first drafts before we move on to editing is that you should really, really, really save your work back up your work because I can speak from experience and I know many other writers who can as well. 
it's very easy to lose your work. And it, I have only lost up to, I think 10,000 words was my worst instance, but that is a big chunk of writing that you never get back. So I would just recommend a few different things. Ever since I lost that 10,000 words, I have started a habit of emailing the document to myself at the end of every writing day. So after I finish a writing session, I email it to myself and I just keep a little folder of all of my work emailed daily over time. Here's one from Instagram that I think we could all benefit from and that is placeholders. So Cup of Ray talks about how like they use it when Maybe they can't picture the rest of the scene, so they're just writing dialogue. That's a great example, but you can do this in any way, shape, or form. So a lot of the time for me, I will use placeholder names or um, I'll put parentheses about something. I'll be like, you know, figure out name for this place later in parentheses or um, in parentheses, uh, describe them later and what they look like or what else I'll put, you know, write this scene later. Even I've done that a few times where I'm like, I really don't know what's supposed to happen here. So I just write like a placeholder of they're going to talk to so-and-so and they're going to do this. And then you move on because placeholders help you not get stuck. Again, it's all about not getting stuck. You guys, Janine said, trust the process and do what works best for you. And that kind of goes along with what living in Natalie, I hope I'm saying that right. said, be patient with yourself and enjoy the writing process. And I actually want to jump over to what Hannah Johnson Wright said because she said something very similar. Find ways to enjoy the process every day instead of only looking forward to the end result. And I think that's really important for all of us to just remember that we got into this because we loved it. A lot of us can get really hard on ourselves and have that writer's guilt or we just keep looking toward the end and that end goal of whatever publishing and that just takes away the joy of the journey that you're on so enjoy the moment enjoy what you're doing right now and i think this is a great place to add advice from renee dugan writing and she said fail faster absolutely like i keep saying don't get stuck in one place you're going to fail but fail faster because the faster you can mess something up, the sooner you can figure out what it should be. So you might have to write something wrong a few times before you figure out what's right. But if you aren't willing to write it wrong first, you won't figure out what's right. And you do have to go through the failing process to find success. It's just part of the process. So like Renee said, fail faster. Alex Ryzen Singh said, write as if no one is watching because no one is watching. <laughs> we talked about editing so much in the first video in the series. So if you missed that, I have it linked below. You can watch it right after this one. But I think the most important thing to share with you guys is that we all have blind spots and weaknesses. You are not alone. So many of us get imposter syndrome when we see the things that we're not good at. But the thing is that everybody has things that they're not good at. So it's normal to feel that imposter syndrome every once in a while and feel like I'm not good enough. And you, it's good actually, because it means that you're aware that you have flaws. If you weren't aware that you had flaws and you thought you were the best writer ever, I could pretty much guarantee that you're not the best writer ever. But if you are aware of your flaws, then you are also capable of growing and working on them. And so just know that Number one, you're not alone, but also, I mean, just think this through logically. Like if everybody has blind spots and weaknesses, nobody's perfect. Nobody's a perfect writer. Nobody's ever written a perfect book. If you look up Amazon reviews of even your favorite book, I guarantee you, you'll find somebody who doesn't like it. And so this is the number one hurdle we have to overcome when we are editing is there is this imposter syndrome that really comes along, at least for me and probably for a lot of you where we're like, I, it's not good enough. Maybe I should just give up, but don't let these weaknesses and blind spots make you feel less than because everybody has weaknesses. You are not alone. You are not different from anybody else. Don't let them stop you from growing and getting better. Instead, use that as your fuel to be like, I'm aware that I have flaws and weaknesses and now I can fix them because I'm going to learn how to get better at each of these things and I'm going to get more aware and I'm going to figure out more of my weaknesses and it's kind of counterintuitive, but that's how you grow is by being willing to accept your own flaws and acknowledge them and not let them hold you back. Honestly, this is kind of a life lesson. I, I have to be real with you guys. There are so many people who they get feedback, negative criticism, whatever. And instead of growing from it and learning from it, they go, no, that's not true. You're judging me. And 
it's not judgment. It's helping you grow. Like if you are willing to acknowledge your weaknesses and accept them and actually see them as a good thing, kind of like Renee said, fail faster, be willing to fail and not get in a funk about it, but instead be like, okay, I just found out about this weakness. And now that I know about it, I can fix it and I can grow. I'm going to get off my soapbox now. And we're going to move on to the next tip, which is to simply learn the rules before you break them. And another tip that I have for editing, and this is just my particular process is I like to personally edit for one thing at a time. So a lot of people might edit for a bunch of things all at once. They might just read through the document. And sometimes I do that and I can't help myself. I need to just kind of hit everything, especially towards the end when you've kind of hit a lot of stuff already and you're just looking for the leftover problems. But in the beginning in particular, I like to edit for, you know, just show versus tell and then just character issues and then just world building issues and then focus on, you know, dialogue and then focus on the story structure and plot holes and that kind of stuff and just kind of take it one thing at a time because I found that that particular way of focusing helps me to really catch a lot more than back when I would try to do everything at once and I just didn't catch as much. So I'm not perfect at it. No writer is perfect. We just covered that. But I really, really try hard, especially in this latest book, The Cursed Hunter, to do one thing at a time and get really focused. And that has been very beneficial to me. If you want to try this technique, but you have trouble, you know, just doing the one thing because you keep seeing other stuff on the side that you want to fix, even just typos or the sentence structure you don't like, I would also recommend that you leave a little note for yourself, either in a notebook or if you're using Microsoft Word, you can just put a comment. You can use the comment feature. We'll talk about that in a second. And you can just leave a note for yourself to be like, come back to this later. I want to address this. I want to write it this way. I want to add more scene setting. You get the idea. Just leave yourself those notes because then it's out of your head head and you can keep moving forward with the focus that you were currently on. Tip number 70 billion probably at this point is it is okay to use the delete button. When you are first drafting, a lot of writers are very focused on word count and growing the word count. But when you get to editing, you kind of want to do the opposite. Uh, the delete button is your friend. And I have found so many cases in my stories when I look back, I'm like, I could have tightened that up. I could have said it with less words and less is more you guys less is more when it comes to good storytelling if you can tighten something up and say the same thing with less words readers really appreciate that and something that i'm working in my own writing is to really strip things down and tighten it up so that it says the same thing with less less is more enough said let's move on to some really cool features in microsoft word all right i want to show you three features in word that i use constantly that people are always asking me about they're like what program is that it's just Microsoft Word, you guys. The track features, the comment feature, and the navigation pane are your best friend. But I have my Word document pulled up for the Cursed Hunter, so you guys are going to get to see the first page as of what day is today? March 11th, 2020. So it's a few months away from publishing. It's not done, but this is what I have right now. So heavy wings beat the hot air. Almost too soft to hear unless you were listening. All right, here's my first issue. I'm going to write this note for myself. Uh, don't say you. Find another way to say it. Okay, so that's just something I want to remember because I think that looks stupid in writing and I don't like it, but I haven't figured out how to rewrite it yet. Okay, and I'm just looking for another place to leave a comment. This one's really easy. Um, feet are a real world measurement. Try to rewrite with a more fantasy measurement, okay? So I've got two notes for examples in here. I'm gonna click through these little arrows and you can actually jump between your comments in here. And so if you would had like a hundred comments, you can run through all of them. Let's pretend I misspelled dragon and this is like an M or something instead, okay? So an editor is gonna come along and your editor will turn on this track changes feature. So it has to be turned on for it to work, first of all. But then they're going to go in and rewrite it. And you can see how it changes color. And it puts up a little comment on the side, just like the other comments, but it's actually telling you what happened. Deleted this word, replaced it with this word. And so once you have track changes on, you can make a lot of unique changes. You can uh, replace words. You can write in a whole new sentence. <laughs> that's horrible. And that's under all markup. But what if you wanted to see, like, what if your editor has written a bunch of new stuff for you and you just want to kind of read it and see 
Does this flow? Do I like it? You can change it to simple markup. You can even get rid of markup altogether just to get a visual for what it looks like or to take an Instagram picture. But I personally prefer to see all markup. It gives me just an idea of what I'm working with. And again, track changes is more what your editor's gonna use than your critique partner. So if your editor sends you back a document like this where you're like, okay, yeah, I misspelled that word or this is better, whatever it is, and you wanna accept it, you just click accept right there. Or if maybe they misunderstood your intentions and you plan to rewrite it differently, you can click reject as well. And then last but not least, I wanted to show you guys under the view tab in the navigation pane, there's a bunch of cool things as well. If you have your document formatted, and I like to personally write in a formatted document, which I will pop up my video on how to do that and link it below for you, go check it out if you wanna do that. But this allows me to pop between chapters really easily and quickly, kind of like Scrivener. And then I also really enjoy being able to click on this one so you can actually scroll through the pages like this and you can find the page that you want easily. And last but not least, you can actually click this little tabby thing to see how many comments and track changes there are. So if you're working with an editor, you can pop this little box up on the side and you can see that right now I've worked through almost all my notes. So there's only five comments and that one little deletion that we just made together. And you can actually see everything here. And this is gonna sound strange, but I actually really enjoy knowing the number of things that I have left to work on because sometimes I can just be like, I'm gonna do 10 today, 10 tomorrow, or 20 and 20, you know, you get the idea. It can help you kind of figure out how much you have to do. When it comes to beta reader advice, my favorite bit of advice is the rule of three. And that's basically saying, if one person has an opinion, it's just an opinion. Even if two people have that opinion, it's still just an opinion. But if three or more people have that opinion, generally that's going to be what most of your readers think and how they feel. So for example, if you have 10 beta readers and eight of them don't like a character because they do something sketchy, then you might wanna address that. But out of the 10 beta readers, maybe only one person doesn't like that character, then you're probably fine, especially if the other nine are like, that character is amazing, I love them so much. That rule of three is gonna help you decide what do I address and do I even address it or is it just their opinion? And this can be especially helpful when beta readers give conflicting feedback, which happens all the time. So use the rule of three when you have a group of people giving you feedback and figure out what is the common consensus. You guys probably know this already, but I have a whole playlist on beta readers. So I will link a few of those videos below that you can check out if you wanna watch more. But one thing that I haven't put in a video yet because I am pretty new to it still is that I've started to use Google Forms to do my beta reader feedback. And the cool thing about Google Forms is that it puts all the information and compiles it for you into one spreadsheet. So in the past, I had my beta readers all sending me their individual Word documents after they finished reading with the questions and answers. And then I would have to take and copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And it would take me literally a week to get through all that information from all the different beta readers. And it was just such a pain. And so now when I use Google Docs, I have them answer directly in Google Docs. I just paste a link into the Word document. They click on it, they answer my questions. And then when everybody's done, I just compile their feedback in that one spreadsheet. And all I have to do really is tweak it a little bit to the way that I want it to look and print it. That's it. It saves me a ton of time and work, and I think my beta readers really like it as well. All right, next we have advice for publishing. And so number one is do your research. Number two, do your research. And oh, look at that. Number three is also do your research. <laughs> If you don't know something, I can almost guarantee that you can find that information on the internet if you're willing to put in the time and energy it takes to find it. And so I would go into that in detail, but honestly, I think if you guys are here watching this video, then you probably already know that. So kudos to you, keep rocking it and keep researching what you need to know. Number two, self-publishing is not a backup plan. And the reason I bring this up is because there are unfortunately a lot of people who think, well, maybe I'll just self-publish publish and see how it does. And then I'll try traditional publishing because they want that speed of self-publishing, but they don't really want to do all the work. They really want the publisher in the end. So 
go after the one that you actually want, you guys. I don't know how else to phrase that, but self-publishing is not a good backup option for many, many reasons, but there's one in particular that I think you should know. If you're self-publishing a book, you're pretty much guaranteeing that it will never be traditionally published. And I actually had a chance to listen to a bunch of agents talk about this once at a conference and they were discussing, you know, generally what would make them even consider a self-published book because the fact is, once you self-publish, they can see your sales. There is a very clear sales record. And unless a book sells thousands and thousands of copies, they're not going to be interested. They were discussing like what number of sales would make them change their mind and consider, not definitely, but just consider a self-published book. And the very lowest number that I heard was 10,000 or more. And I heard other agents say, no, nah, I would need it to be like 50,000. And just so you guys have like a idea of comparison, the average traditionally published book sells roughly 2,000 to 3,000 in its lifetime. And I say average because there's more and there's less, but those are the statistics that I've heard. So we're talking like three to five times more than the average just to give you an idea. Number three is that self-publishing is a long game. And this is true in both traditional publishing and self-publishing, but in different ways. Traditional publishing, it's very much a long game because there's a lot of waiting. You have to query and then wait to hear back. And then if you get an agent, you have to wait to hear from a publisher. And then if you get a publishing deal, you have to wait for it to get published a very long time. And so there's a lot, it's, it's a very long game, obviously. And then for self-publishing, it's a long game when it comes to making money and learning. There's such a big learning curve. And again, I have a video all about this called how hard is it to self-publish? Like how hard is it really? So if you wanna know more, I don't wanna repeat myself, but I will link that below for you to go watch after this video because there's a lot that goes into self-publishing before you really learn what you need to know. And that struggle is normal. There's really no such thing as an overnight success in publishing. It might look like it, uh, from a distance, but if you get to know anybody's story, you will find out very quickly that there are almost guaranteed to be years and years of hard work and persistence that they put in before they became that overnight success. So just be aware of that. And if you're in it for the money, it's probably not the best choice. If you are getting into publishing, especially self-publishing for external validation, it's also probably not the best choice. Neither of these external motivators or really any other external motivators are enough for you to truly succeed and thrive in publishing. So just know that, know that you need an internal motivation if this is going to be a good fit for you. But let's move on to other advice that I think is also important, but that we haven't really had a chance to touch on yet. Number one is that writing friends are one of the absolute best resources for helping you finish your book. They are a wonderful soundboard, but they are also accountability. And they are also people who are going through what you're going through and are going to understand it like nobody else. We'll talk quite a bit more about writing friends in part three in this series, which I will link below as soon as it's live on writing resources, because writing friends are one of the greatest resources you can possibly have and I want to really dig into how to find them but the short version the advice version is to simply be a friend I want to bring in a little bit more of that advice from the Instagram poll so author Brianna Rima said that the best advice is that writing should always come first before platform and the other extra stuff and I strongly agree I actually have a video called writing comes first when I just sort of had that as a revelation and I realized that I had been doing a lot of the more platform stuff and the things that are more instantly gratifying, the things that you can finish in a day versus a book which can take a year. And it's very easy to do that because like I said, it, it's that accomplishment. I personally like to check things off a list and so I will often do the smallest things first because then check them off the list, right? And so I would do my Instagram posts and social media and fix my website and you name it and author newsletter, but those things should come after the writing. And so if you can really prioritize writing, that is going to progress your book along quite a bit faster because there's always something that's going to not get done. That's normal, that's just life. We, we all have a limited amount of time. But if you put your book first, then you're much more likely to be guaranteed to get that done versus if you put it last, which a lot of us do. Emily Morgan says, write for yourself first. 
I completely agree with this one as well. If you are getting a little too focused on what other people want to hear and what other stories are out there, it can really take away that creativity and it can take away the joy of writing. And so just remember the stuff that you wanted to write and why you got into writing. I think that is everything that I can think of at the moment. And I think I got through all the Instagram advice feedback, but if you guys have sent in more after I recorded this or if I missed any, I'm sorry. There is just so much good advice out there and this video could be hours longer if we were to go into all of it, but I hope that this will give you a really good starting place and encourage you and let you know that you're not alone, which are two of the biggest things that we need when we are very first starting out and trying to figure out the whole writing process. So you are not alone. What you're going through is normal and the best thing you can do is get writing friends who can help you along the way. Give me a shout out in the comments if there's something else you want a video on. I am excited to add it to my list and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you liked it and if it was helpful. Let me know your favorite piece of advice that actually helped you and made you feel better in this video or also you could drop your favorite other piece of advice that wasn't mentioned for everybody else who's going to watch in the future. I would love that and I hope you guys really got a lot out of this video. My goal for the series is to help you finish your book so I'm very excited for you. I hope you are excited for you. Thank you for watching. You guys know the drill. There's a thumbs up button. There's a subscribe button. There's all the things down there that you should click because they help me out and I really appreciate it and I'm glad that you're here and subscribed so thank you so much. You're the best and I'll talk to you again very soon.